Hi, this is Chris Wyatt from Marvel Spider-Man and Stretch Armstrong and the Flex Fighters, and you're listening to Neil Before Pod. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a special lockdown edition of Neil Before Pod, the podcast that never really liked going outside anyway, so it's all fine. I'm your host, Craig, and we're here to talk about some of the semi-recent news and nonsense that's been going on in the world of entertainment, not the world at large. So to help me with the news and other stuff, we have Aaron. Check it out. And Chris. Hello. Hello. So we're here. We're locked down. We are remote we're all safe we're ready to talk about some stuff yes stuff some Good. stuff yeah all of the stuff so other podcasts do this regularly we don't so we've got some news that might be out of date some that might be in date and some that you've forgotten about so sell it really sell it <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but here it is so there <laughs> here it is Welcome, listeners, to something that might be half ass good, but you don't really <laughs> don't spend too much time listening, you know. Other people do this. Other options are available. However, <laughs> this is ours. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, it's in date in the sense that there's not much else that's come since, and there's been no real follow up to any of it, so it's still current in that sense. So, listeners, you might as well listen to it because there's nothing better out there. So, just get over exactly. This is the best podcast ever. <laughs> The disclaimer, it was up to date at the time of recording, but by October, when you're listening to this, maybe <laughs> slightly out of date. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. But strangely, not that much. It was weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we should start with a bit of a, a round robin on what we've been watching in this lockdown situation that we're still in since the last time we kind of talked about stuff that we were watching. So, Aaron, do you want to kick us off with a few things that you've been consuming other than food? Yes, and I want to remember what they are. And I told you what they were, and I didn't write them down, and now I'm going to try and stall until I can think about Umbrella Academy Season 2. That's one of them. Good. Do I need to give you the full list? Because I'm trying to remember what the other things I said to you were. Well, maybe not a full list. There was one thing we tried it, and it became clear that Andrew had like 19 things, so we had to cut him off after a while. It's like, okay, Andrew, <laughs> you watch a lot of stuff. That's enough. <laughs> let's, let's move things on. We are going to be here all night otherwise. I've I've also been watching Umbrella Academy Season 2, and I have been thoroughly enjoying it because it's uh, it's in the 60s, so it's got an awesome soundtrack. <laughs> I've I've spent most of my time while watching Umbrella Academy with Shazam open so that I can steal <laughs> songs and go, oh, I like that one. Oh, I like that one. I like that one. See, I, I wasn't sure about the whole 60s thing when I was getting the teasers. You know, I thought, oh, man, this is just going to be a total gimmick. Why on earth would you go back to the 60s? You know, it's time travel. You've got to pick somewhere, I suppose. But to be fair, I didn't find it totally gimmicky when I was watching it. I'm struggling to explain why, because I think I would struggle to explain why I had my doubts about it. I mean, there's a time travel show, so you've got to pick something, but maybe that's just my own prejudices, I'm not sure. Has it always been a time travel show, or is this a bit of a surprise? It literally opens with time travel, yeah. All right, okay. I haven't seen a single second of this, so... You might like it. This season, I think, has had some Legion-esque elements to it that you might like. <laughs> Including dance numbers. So, you know, it's, uh, it's got dance numbers. Uh, what so. else do you need? Enough said. Everybody watch it. Yeah. Oh, also a talking goldfish. So, you know. Dance numbers and a talking dance goldfish. Dance numbers, talking goldfish, 60s music. Need I say more? Consider yourself sold. <laughs> cool. So, Aaron, you've been watching it, but you didn't say really whether you liked it. You locked into the 60s premise after a while, but did you like the season overall? Have you seen it all, or have you got some to go? So, I have seen it all, and I will say that it has the notable characteristic of something I just watched all the way through, and I don't have many of those. When I do have them, I like to say I couldn't put it down, you know. So it's, it's the only thing for a long time that, that I've had that. And I don't necessarily know that I was even expecting that at all, because it's really difficult to do a second season, I think. You set up your premise, 
You do what you've got to do in the first season. That's how you sold it to the producers. That's where it's come from, your source material. You do it. You set yourself a cliffhanger, and then you think, right, ladies and gentlemen, season two, what on earth do we do now? But I wonder if they did have a longer plan or if they were just really good at writing or if there was just more source material. I actually have never read any of the Dark Horse stuff. But yeah, I, I loved it, watched it all the way through. I'm not sure how much we want to say in terms of spoilers. Mm. You've not called spoilers yes or no, so I feel like I'm... <laughs> I would say I'm, keep I'm, it moderate in terms of spoilers. Moderate spoilers, yeah. more time travel. We've always said that, so that's fine. It does do, I guess, that do it again but do it different set up that whole idea of keep it the same whilst changing everything set up as in that there is a sort of a broken family and they get together and then in season two the family is broken apart and so they get together again so they do follow the formula but in the way that you're supposed to follow the formula as in give your audience what they're expecting so i'll say that the basic structure worked well for me and then on top of that with your foreground then they pick the 60s with a reason. And that's always good. Rather than just saying, where should we go? Where's cool? They managed to get Alison into the rights of black people being crushed underfoot and so on, and what was being done to protest against it. They did use, and I think this isn't too much of a spoiler because it is in everything, they did use Kennedy's assassination. Well, you can't go to the 60s without in some way covering Kennedy's assassination, can you? It's like forbidden. Mm. You have to cover. (laughs) And that's, again, where I thought, oh, really, should we have gone to this because everybody goes to this? But, again, I think it works because they pick it with a reason because Five is a time-travelling mega-assassin. And it's like, okay, what's the most important assassination in all of America? Okay, well, we picked that out then. There was only a choice of two here. And, you know, we went with the one that people are probably going to remember more. So I was concerned that a lot of these things were going to be maybe tropey or just too well hashed. But as I say, because it fitted what the characters have already been set up as, it did just slot nicely into the formula. And the last thing I'll put in is it was just as funny. One of the reasons I kept watching is because it was still well written. The jokes were actually funny. It did make me laugh. It didn't slot into, oh, yeah, trying to set up a running gag. I suppose that's funny. No, it did actually make me laugh. So, yeah, 10 out of 10, we'll watch again. Cool. I've been planning to catch up with it or catch it. I mean, catching up implies that I've seen any of it, but I haven't. So I've now got kind of gaps in my viewing schedule in terms of things that I've been watching that I'll come to shortly. So I might watch that kind of while I'm having lunch at work. Definitely worth a shout. And I think they've confirmed that they've got a season three as well, I think. So it's uh, it's definitely worth a watch. I'm the same as Aaron. Really enjoyed watching it. It's got some similar beats to the first season, but in a slightly different way. And that makes it enjoyable to watch. The 60s aesthetic that they do is done really, really well. Between sort of set design and costume and different bits that they've done, it's really, really impressive and well put together. Cool. So check that out if you want. It's on Netflix, and it'll be on Netflix for the rest of time, also Mm. known as how long we'll be stuck in this kind of situation. (laughs) Whatever that situation is. Aaron, anything else you've been watching? I will certainly want to give you one more, which is Transformers War... Or is, War is it War of or War 4 Cybertron now? The Netflix Transformers thing. Netflix Whatever. Transformers yeah. thing, yes. <laughs> enough that do. And that is slightly harder for me to talk about unbiased because I'm a Generation 1 fan right from childhood. I suppose that does mean the expectation might be higher, so maybe I'm also more likely to be disappointed. But having put that bias on the table, I feel like I now declare that I really enjoyed it. It wasn't one that I watched all the way through as quickly like Umbrella Academy, so I won't say it was like a 10 out of 10, but I'd certainly want to give it a 9 for me. It was capable of adding something new in whilst giving me everything I want as a Generation 1 fan who felt that the recent films were just horrific and unwatchable. Except Bumblebee. Except Bumblebee, which I did like, to be fair. I did like Bumblebee. So hailing back to my past good 
tick for me, might not be a tick for anybody else. They didn't assume that you'd watch that, though. There was the obligatory exposition, which was noticeable, I think, even for a real fan. It didn't lose too much pace to that, though, because they do spread it out into various episodes and it does at least come up where it's needed because the characters don't necessarily know what's being spoken about so it was there as noticeable but one of the things that really stuck out for me was the opening didn't need exposition they went straight into the the character setup and very noticeably for something that's toy-based Hardly anybody used the person's name they were speaking to as many times in a sentence as possible so you knew which toy to buy. And that that was always going to be a danger, and they dodged it completely. There are a few characters that had to be mentioned, and I'm okay with that because I didn't notice that until I looked back on it. So I think they've done a lot to actually upgrade this to be a story that other people can watch and there's the necessary exposition, but actually you could just get into it. And it is darker. I don't know where it's it's aiming at, actually. I think it said teen when it came up, but it was certainly something I reckon the Generation 1 fans could watch as well as a slightly older audience. It's a bit grim for your under 10s. Okay. But it's not so grim as a teenager. A young, well, obviously not mid-teens, but a young teenager, 13, could be okay with it, 13, 14, and they wouldn't find it too grim. But yeah, if I was showing my seven-year-old it, I would expect them to be losing interest or trying to find a place not to be. But to me, of course, another tick is I like it a bit darker. I like it to be a bit more meaningful rather than being purely a romp. That's not why I'm watching something like an old 80s cartoon. They were never designed that way. Yeah, I did actually watch this. Kind of watched it while I was doing other things, but I found it easy enough to follow. I wasn't really feeling it, though. I wasn't all that invested in it, and I don't really have that nostalgic connection to Transformers. My connection to it, such as it is, began with the Michael Bay films, really. That was when I started. Oh, my fucking God. You're going to have to bleep that, but I can't hold that back in. That is not a connection to Transformers. (laughs) There's a connection to explosions, guns, and bombs, and nothing more. Well, I mean, so. there are Transformers, you know, in it, but... Yeah. No, 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 probably not. They're just kind of hunks of metal just beating <laughs> the crap out of each other. Not really the same thing at all, I don't think. Yeah, but I wasn't, I wasn't really feeling it for whatever reason. It, it didn't capture me enough. It sounds a bit unfair to say it didn't really capture it if it's one of those things that you weren't trying to watch, you got it on in the background. I think that's probably not a fair test i'm not saying it would have captured you anyway but i'd want you to sit down and actually watch it through without distraction before i'd you know lean too heavily on that as a crook i mean i get distracted quite easily when i'm doing other things and i have stuff on in the background so there was quite a lot of it where i was sort of watching what was going on or what was being said and i just don't think it was for me well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's fine. nothing would change that certainly well it's interesting the voice of optimus prime is some guy that did a really good impression on youtube and then they just essentially hired him and let him do the voice for this. So it's not Peter Cullen this time. They decided to go with someone else. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people, I say a lot, that's not fair actually. I've seen on the internet some complaints about the voices and I wasn't actually sure why. I need to go back in and look at that if I want to have a proper discussion about it. Obviously, I can't really do that without having read the stuff. But I would comment on it because it's picked up that sort of reaction. And I, I thought the voices were actually really well done because... They weren't the original voices, and neither do I want them to be, but they captured the elements that they needed to for each of the personalities, I thought. And a bit of an Easter egg for the fans getting a a sound alike for Optimus Prime. Fair enough. Yeah, why not? How many times can Peter Collins say the same stuff about (laughs) Cybertron being destroyed? Yeah, well... (laughs) There's no reason to keep bringing the guy back in, unless they're <laughs> giving him infinite money, I suppose. But Well, I imagine he doesn't mind the paycheck. You want me to say all this stuff that I've said before, but slightly yeah. differently? Sign me up. <laughs> Maybe he just plays it down the line on a soundboard now. He's just <laughs> yeah. recorded it and just plays it down. What do you need? Freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Here it is. What else do you need? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've recorded six different takes of it. Use one of them. Doesn't matter. I think on that, though, it's definitely worth commenting on the fact I'm a fan, but I stopped watching because there's too much. There's literally too much of this for anybody but the hardened fan to go in and watch every single Transformers thing that's ever been done. But 
I was therefore looking for a new angle here. And I think if you've seen everything before, you've read, you know, read all the comics, seen all the spin off and, and reboots and so on, you're not going to find anything new in terms of the plot. For me, it was though, as an old generation one, because a lot of this stuff on this time period, we got through the later comics as flashbacks. So it was interesting to see it play out. But even those that do know the story already, there's enough of a mix round with some of the characters that you've probably not seen exactly that variant. It would be an alt verse. But more importantly, I think, is the darker tone because it is that little bit nastier than it's much more believably a civil war and it's much more believably two groups who used to be together forced apart irreconcilably so and in the kids tv show you were asked to just believe autobot equals good decepticon equals bad got decepticon in the name so clearly bad you know and it was <laughs> it was easy to grasp as kids Whereas they do a lot more in this one to say, here's the history. Here's where we used to fight together. Here's the problem we had. Oh, by the way, you're racist. And that's why we're apart. No, no, we're not racist. You've got a bad ideology and you've let it corrupt you. And obviously they don't say that, but that's what's playing out in their speeches. When they're actually showing you their anger, you no longer have this really base setup of good versus evil. It's actually really nasty. It's the setup of a proper civil war. It's a group of freedom fighters or terrorists, depending on your point of view, who overthrew an evil overlord and then couldn't agree on how the future was going to be, which is the very essence of, well, name a country that's currently going through strife of that type and it it is every part of that story and that's something pretty hideous to give to a kid and say hey what do you want to hear about today johnny you know civil war her brother killing brother you know you're not going to pick that out but it's very relevant and i can never tell you this is going to be literature or shakespeare but what i want to point out is it's relevant you know it is something that a teen could look and and say, oh, yeah, this is actually happening in the world around me. Maybe it's a, a minor introduction to stories of that more adult but meaningful tone. So I do think there is a reason to watch this for everybody that doesn't matter whether you've seen it or not before, just because of that attempt to bring in a more relevant storyline. It's interesting you should say about people looking for something super new aren't going to get it because there are two video games that are essentially this concept. So there's War for Cybertron and Fall of Cybertron, I think the two games are called. And from what I remember about playing those games, which I have on the PS3, they cover a lot of the similar ground. So the events themselves play out slightly differently, but the ground is the same. I mean, it is the same sort of conflict. So some of it felt a bit familiar to me because I remembered those games after having played them once. And then you get a kind of smattering of it at the beginning of Bumblebee as well. You see the point where they're about to lose a war and they have to go somewhere else. So there's two other chapters of this thing, I think. There's at least one more. Yeah, it's a trilogy. The first six episodes are called Chapter 1, Episode, whatever. So I think there's two more chapters. So I guess it'll end with them on Earth and establishing that status quo, and then they might continue with a version of that story? That would be natural, but almost a shame just because they have started out with something that is darker, is connected to the history of Cybertron, and then to suddenly turn and have them now be dealing with the problems of Earth. To follow that through completely, they'd have to say, well, we understand civil war. Let's go to some war-torn country and try and help people there because that's what we think we should be doing. You know? And it's like, no, you really cannot take large interstellar robots and put them into a war-torn Earth nation. That's, <laughs> that's going to be too politically sensitive. So I don't know where it goes in that direction without losing its tone. But I should be watching and, and hope to find out. Yeah, cool. So that's Transformers. Watch it on Netflix because it's there and there'll be more coming, I don't know, at some point. They haven't announced, I don't think, when the next thing will be. So any last things that you want to remark on that you've been watching or should we move people? 
I think switch over says because I've said a bunch of stuff uh, next. Cool. Chris, what have you been watching? I've had quite a few different bits and pieces. I've been finding through lockdown that I've been going back to watch a lot of stuff that I've enjoyed in the past, sort of doing little rewatches, be it films or TV. I've been a lot on Netflix, a bit like Aaron. So a couple of end of the world themed ones. So we've already had the Umbrella Academy, but I also watched a show called Salvation about an asteroid coming to the Earth to save us all, or more, destroy us all. I don't know which one you want to read that as. (laughs) Put us out of our misery. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, on the TV show, they're treating it as a bad thing, but at the moment I'm thinking an (laughs) asteroid might actually be the best uh, solution to all our problems. But yes, I watched that, which I enjoyed a little bit, actually. It It was quite good. It's got some of the usual tropes and things in it that I don't quite enjoy, but overall was pretty good. Umbrella Academy... I've already noticed and already mentioned, but also Snowpiercer, the TV adaptation of Snowpiercer, which is set before the film. Now, that I actually enjoyed. I was expecting to not really be interested in it because I've seen the film. I was like, well, you kind of know where this is going. Don't really care about the characters. You know the outcomes, da 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 But actually, they did make me care about the characters and the way it's gone, and it was quite an interesting show, and I'm actually glad that they've got a season two out of it as well. (laughs) I really enjoyed watching that. I think they did, again, you know, obviously a lot of the concept and everything was already done in the film, which has obviously given them a good grounding to base the train on that they've got at the moment. But the film is set a bit further down the line, excuse the pun. (laughs) So... (laughs) everything's a bit more worn down and clapped out by the time you get to the film, whereas this is still within the initial years of their journey rather than further down. So is it actually a prequel to the film or is it just another adaptation of the graphic novel? I think they've said it's an other adaptation and shouldn't be treated as directly interacting with the film. I don't think it's gone off pace at the moment. I would need to check, but I don't think it's gone too far off where it is at the moment if they wanted to tie it into the film. But it would probably make sense for them to say that the two are sort of alternate universe stories, maybe, so that it gives them a bit more freedom in the TV show, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like you don't really need to be confusing people by saying, oh, no, you can watch the film because we can't afford Chris Evans on this Netflix show, (laughs) even though he is doing a Netflix show. Or maybe a Netflix film. It's a film. Yeah, it's a film with the Russo brothers and someone else. Ryan Reynolds, maybe. But he, Chris Evans is doing Netflix now, because why not? Because why wouldn't you? Yeah. I've seen Snowpiercer. I'll maybe watch it one of these days. I've seen the film, but not this TV show, so... Aaron, you watched it as well, didn't you? Well, I've not finished it yet. For me, that's where it is. it's not as good as something like Umbrella Academy, because I was able to put it down in favour of something else. So I'm several episodes behind, but I did like it. I did keep watching, and I'm not somebody to stay with something. If I don't like it, I will just stop. I've no interest in, oh, it gets good in episode 215. Yeah, <laughs> no, thank you. I don't need homework. So I did want to keep watching, but it was intriguing, but I'm hard-pressed to say that I thought, oh, there was this element that really stood out for me that made me think this is a new idea. It was a new idea for that sort of detective style in terms of putting it on the Snowpiercer. But is there anything special so far? I've only seen about half of it. So is there anything special about the detective? Well, no, he's a guy from the Snowpiercer. Is there there anything special about the murders? No, they're kind of murders on the Snowpiercer. And they might reveal something that Chris has seen that he can say, oh, it's definitely worth getting to the last episode because it is totally different. But it has this background, obviously, that is everybody stuck on a train. And then... I don't know if it was trying to show anything special about the problems that exist in a class-based society or whether it just happened to be set in a class-based society. So whether it's trying to give you the message or not, I'm not sure. But because it's not trying to give me a message at the moment, I don't think. It's a detective show on a really freaky, horrific train 
And that's fine, it's interesting, but it's not taking me to another level where I'm thinking, oh, that was so good. I need to see what happens specifically with that when first class meets third class and blah, 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 you know. I don't know, Chris, is there anything more in, if you've gone to the end of that, is, is there more in it in terms of a message around class or is that just a backdrop to it's a murder show? I would say the murder takes a back seat in the second half of the season i don't know how far you've got along and i'm not wanting to throw spoilers out on the podcast Mm. obviously but it it sort of evolves a little bit it has what you would typically call it sort of little mid-season point where it sort of flips around a little bit it does play more on the class aspect i mean it's very blatant because you're going through the train (laughs) you've got people at the back who didn't have their ticket you've got your third class you've got your second class and you've got your god tier first class at the front that makes first class on the british rail look mighty impressive (laughs) you've got your sort of first class sitting up at the front and it does play around with that a little bit as you get further along and it goes a little bit into why and how the train is there which I think is something that, you know, you've got to try and take the premise. That's the difficult thing about this program. And the same thing with the film as well. You've got to go, okay, so the solution to global cooling is that you get a train and you run it on a track all the way around the world. Okay, cool. And this yeah. track doesn't just fall into the sea. Okay, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> let's, let's go with that. The train keeps going. Okay, yep. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, how often is railway maintenance done and like, yeah. Our world, you know. You're asking the wrong questions. <laughs> if if you want to ask that sort of question, you cannot watch this show. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is actually a real difficulty with the first episode because in the film, you're watching artistic metaphor. The fact that they're on a train is irrelevant. It doesn't matter because it's specifically going into a conceptual sci-fi. And to go through the door in the very opening, if you will, you've either accepted that or you've turned it off, you know. Whereas when they open it with this TV series, they really try and make sure you know this science can work. And it really was a desperate action, but it was a good choice of an action. And people really wanted on this train because it was seen as the last possible option. And they go into the science of ecosystems and, and food science. And, and they're, they're, oh, yeah, you're really chucking some science at me here. But you just think, yeah, if anything dislodges even one part of your track, it's over. We have the whole leaves on the track joke in Britain, and it's just the next level up from that. And Because you're in a world that's been completely destroyed by bad weather. Any hurricane, tornado, avalanche, tree falling down, it's over. Your whole train is done. So... Stop asking questions and leave our train if you can't do that. Just get off right now. It is weird because they've tried to put so much effort into convincing you the science is real. That really stuck with me through episode one because I think, stop it. You cannot convince me this is real. just, (laughs) Just don't bother. But they really go heavily into it. And fortunately, the foreground plot just says, stop looking. Stop. Look at me. Look at me now. You know, and okay, there's a dead body and it's a detective and there's people feeling sad and... And we all know there's cannibalism coming and so on and so on. So it does, when it stops trying to do the science and stops drawing your attention to what cannot be possibly true, you, you do get pulled in. So I think based on what Chris has said, I'll definitely keep watching. But yes, Craig, don't ask those questions. Just don't. <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically Poirot on a post-apocalyptic Orient Express. That's the best way to see at least the first half. <laughs> we'll see on the second half. But yes, that's the first half. There we go. So check that out. There'll be a season two as well. I wonder if it'll be another murder. Well, if someone else has been killed, what do we do? Let's do the same as we did last time. Investigate it. It's one of these people on this train. At least we know that. There's no external factors here because everyone else is dead. <laughs> Not about <laughs> Cool. Chris, anything else that you want to remark on that you've had a look at? What else have I been watching? Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. I know that we are likely to talk about that on a a separate podcast of its own devices. However, I've been really enjoying the recent season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. The recent and final. Yes. You can tell because the adverts have started for the prop auction. (laughs) Yeah, the finalist, finalist, finalist ever final, final season. I don't know how often we've commented on the final season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., but this is it. This is the one. Until Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Volume 2 resumes. <laughs> but yeah, been enjoying that quite a bit. They seem to have just found their groove. I don't know. <laughs> Let's say they've found their groove. In the last couple of seasons, they seem to have found their place and their running. Granted, it's taken several seasons to get us to this point, but they seem to have found their niche and they've been doing it rather well. 
I think since they've dropped trying to tie themselves in too heavily to the films, which I think they gave up on quite a few seasons ago, to be fair, they seem to have found their own. Yeah, I think with it being its final season, it's going out on a real high, at least so far. I think there's every possibility it could all fall apart in the last three episodes, (laughs) which are left at the time of recording. But I think it's been really good. In terms of finding its place, I think Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has been one of those shows that's certainly once it got beyond the we have to tie into every Marvel film that's coming out, and that's really tedious because it just gets in the way of other stories that we could be telling. Once they got away from that, then they just started, let's just try this for a season. Let's try and send them into the future because that's fun. Or let's try and put them in a Matrix-like simulation because we'll see what that does. And let's try, maybe some of them have been replaced by robots. And, then you know, it's... (laughs) <laughs> Let's try all this wacky comic book stuff because we can. And then instead of being this, oh, yeah, we are adjacent to the interesting stuff, it's we're actually going to be the interesting stuff. Rather, you might be watching the show because, hey, someone might say the word Thor and then we can all cheer. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what <laughs> certainly was happening early season one. It's like, look, we're cleaning up after that big fight that Thor was in in the recently released movie, Thor the Dark World. <laughs> now in cinemas yeah now in yes. cinemas yeah <laughs> unless you're watching on a streaming service five years from now in which case <laughs> you can also watch this on that same streaming service probably but yeah. maybe not because <laughs> it's true the, the link just pops up at the bottom for you <laughs> yeah, that's okay. it. Yeah. yeah yeah so once they got away from that i think yeah we'll talk about that in significant detail yeah. when we do the wrap-up podcast i thought, I thought it was worth mentioning though sure is that your last thing or anything final yeah, let's go for that as my, my final one. Cool. Okay, what I've been watching, I watched the adaptation of Brave New World, which is on the Peacock streaming service, the latest streaming service that will last for a little while before getting swallowed by another one. You know, that seems to happen. They seem to crop up for a little while, then they realise, hang on, we're small time in a big pond here. Nah, <laughs> let's get rid of this. But it's the NBC one. I think the adaptation of Brave New World is okay. I really liked it to begin with, and then it loses its way towards the end. I love the book, and considering how extensively I studied the book when I was at school, I know it very well. So they deviate from it quite a bit. They do a reasonable job of establishing the whole tiered society, people programmed to do whatever, but they don't go into enough detail as to the pros and cons of it. It just In this episode, we're deciding it's a bad thing. And then the next episode, we're deciding it's still a bad thing. And then, oh, look, here's no, no, it's a good thing. And that sounds like balance, but it isn't. It's just individual scenes where someone has that opinion and you never get the kind of conversation about it. Alden Ehrenreich is in it. The man who was a guy called Han Solo, but not really Han Solo. And yeah, it's good to see that he's still getting work because it turns out he's actually all right. But... Would I recommend watching it? If you like the book, it's an interesting take for a while. I enjoyed it for what it was. It doesn't take long to watch. It's only like eight episodes, 40-odd minutes each or whatever it is, so it's not too bad. So would you say to dive into the book first or dive into the TV show first? Well, I would say read the book for sure. The, the book is a classic for a reason, and it does all this kind of interesting stuff about here's society, and we already live in a class society, and is that a good thing? And what would happen if you had no choice on what class you're in, except you kind of don't have a choice about what class you're in? But what would happen if you were programmed to not care? Would that be a good thing or not? So you've got like the epsilons, they're the janitors, they clean up, they serve you. They do essentially the dirty jobs that people don't really want to do, but they're being done. And they're programmed to not want anything else. So they're completely content with their life. And then you have like the alphas and betas who are the upper echelons that they basically take drugs and participate in orgies a lot. That's what they do. They live the life of luxury. And the whole point is, well, it'd be good if you were born into this or if you were grown into this aspect of the society. But if you're an epsilon, maybe it's not so great. But either way, you won't really care and you won't really want to be in. So that's why you introduce Alden Ehrenreich, John the Savage, who is born the traditional way and has an opinion on it, on how things should work. So if it's not trying to take you through an ideological discussion and being a meaningful analysis, then what type of show is it? Obviously, it's not an action flip, I assume, but what is it trying to do then? Or is it trying to give you the ideology but not succeeding? I think it's trying. 
but not necessarily succeeding. It does reasonably well at doing its world building in the first two or three episodes. I was really engaged at that point. I was like, oh, this is a really good adaptation. And then when you introduce John and you see his world and then compare and contrast it to the world that's supposed to be the lead character. It's this character you could start on, Lenina, her name is. She's a beta plus, which means she's not at the top of society, but she's got access to the top of society. And then when she visits like the Savage Lands, which is an amusement park in effect, so you get to see, look at these monogamous people, what's all this about? And let's all laugh at the way we used to do things. It's to give you a commentary on, is this world perfect or is it just waiting to fall apart? And then Hmm. when it all starts to inevitably fall apart, as soon as John gets introduced into society, it, it kind of falls off the rails at that point. But if you're familiar with the book... I would say give it a go. If you're not familiar with the book, maybe give it a little bit of a go anyway. See so how you get on with the first couple of episodes. Play. You'll either decide if you want to see it or not after that point, I would say. Yeah, I've not read it, so I'll need to pick up a copy of the book. Yeah, it's an easy read. It's a really easy read. I mean, it's sort of standard grade level analysis kind of thing. But I'll be able to get half of it then. <laughs> You'll get some of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, why not? So that's all right. So I'll watch that. I caught up with season two of the Charmed reboot. It's worse than season one. Although more accurately, it's about the same as season one, but since it does nothing to improve on the nonsense that was season one, it's worse because you've just made me sit through this and it's not... Well, then nobody made me do it, but you know what I mean? I sat through it and <laughs> it's not improved Contractually whatsoever. bound. Yeah. <laughs> Once you start. Yeah, they had all this hype about oh yeah, we're changing things up for season two. We're going to make it way better. We've understood your criticism. They changed the setting. But everything else is still stupid. So, not a fan. Probably won't watch season three. Let's flash forward to next year's one where I'm like, oh, yeah, watch season three. What do they do? Better not be still doing a COVID cast <laughs> next oh, year. God. Yeah, geez. But one thing I did like was the second season of Roswell, New Mexico, which is another adaptation of the Roswell High book series. And I watched the original Roswell High, which then became Roswell in its final season back when it was on TV. And I remember liking it at the time, but I haven't revisited it. So I probably shouldn't because I probably hate it now. But the second season was way better than the first season. They ironed out a lot of the glitches they had in season one that weren't really working. They made the characters deeper. They had more to say about immigration and all these things, which is a good thing to do when you're in New Mexico and some of your characters are aliens and others are like Hispanic. So it's rife for that kind of commentary. So they've done a lot of race flipping. They've done a lot of, well, not a lot of gender flipping. They've done some gender flipping and they've done some sexuality flipping as well. So they kind of cover all the bases, but they don't do it in an exploitative way. They do it in a way that feels like it's part of the DNA of the show. I think it works really well. And I was, yeah, I was pretty impressed with season two. So I want to see season three. I'll actually look forward to watching it. But I find myself quite gripped by season two. So shows you might have watched back in the like late 90s, early 2000s reboots. That's what I've been about lately, apparently. <laughs> one good, one not so good. It's a CW show. Bear that in mind. Both are CW shows, but and both are CW shows, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Other than that, they're... Really good. And for Legion, Kerry, she's in it. Oh. Amber Midthunder is her name, but she's in it. That's the actor's name, not the character's name. The character's name is Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> so that's been about it, other than I watched Transformers. I watched The Old Guard, which I thought was okay. Mm. Just okay, though. I feel The Old Guard was a good setup to another film or another series. Definitely. Well, I think we'd said off, or you said offline, Aaron on those conversations that we have that we don't record, rare as they are, <laughs> that you said it felt like the first episode of a TV series, and I definitely got that vibe from it. Yeah, I mean, they make it even more obvious when they do, and I don't know if it is actually a post credit scene, but it is effectively a post credit scene. I don't think it is. I think it is just at the, the end of the main plot, but, you know, it's the start of a new plot completely. Yeah. They've been seeding, to be fair. I mean, they're not just totally... Out of nowhere, but I think even throughout the whole thing, they were angling for the group dynamic of a TV series. We've got the guy in the back office that we have radio comms with who sends us our missions. Check, you know, <laughs> team of people going out into the field with history on whether they can or cannot trust each other. Check, you know, I mean, it, it is definitely that formula. And I don't know if 
the source material had that in it too. And maybe it did, because maybe it was a series of, was it a series of comic books? So maybe it did have that episodic format anyway. So maybe that's not something I've discovered. It was always there. But yeah, it was definitely a setup. And I went online because it seems so much like a setup and thought, well, oh, I wonder what they've said about this. And it seems to be that the guy who's in charge of it has said, there will be a second film if the fans demand one. We're ready for it. If you want it, we're going to do it. And does Netflix pay for it? And if Netflix pay for it. <laughs> yeah. He did say film, though. He didn't say TV series. Yeah, well, the pedigree of cast they've got, you can probably get them to do maybe a couple of films, but ask them to do 10 episodes or whatever it is, yeah. then it might be a bit of an ask. But I think there was a lot of it where the whole TV series bit for me was... There's a lot of stuff in there where it's kind of like, okay, we're going to introduce this idea with the intention of developing it later, but they don't because they're maybe waiting for a second film. And I think that tends to be a bad thing when you don't have another film. It's like Elite Battle Angel. It's like, wait till you see how the other half live, but not in this film. Well, wait, we're not making another one. Whoops. (laughs) So you get that kind of thing. So what is it like to be an immortal soldier in all these wars ethically? Don't really cover it. I didn't find the action to be that exciting either. And the histories of the characters, they're kind of implied and they don't explain them to you, although sometimes they do. Sometimes they they do this. It's like, hi, we are a gay couple and we've been together for hundreds of years. That's clumsy. But there's other things in it where I'm just like, okay, I maybe would have liked to see this covered as in the ethics of what happens if you happen to be on the wrong side of history but thought you were on the right side of history? What happens if you fought for the wrong side in this one war? And that kind of stuff. I think the difficulty along those lines was more that you have to pick one thing and what you're saying there gives you all the range of options, you know, and you, you couldn't possibly do all of those. But I will agree that I think they picked one. And then the reason I didn't find it to be a great film myself was because they didn't play it out properly in full. I mean, maybe because it was an action setup, I thought it was a good sort of sci-fi film that teased an issue that was worth talking about, but didn't settle into it completely, which was the whole idea of the loss of motivation that comes with not being able to see the wood for the trees. And it comes out in the board that the main character gets shown at the end without spoiling it too much. I can just say that there is this board that shows the essence of this plot point and the main character looks at this board and of course gets their realization but it's done with exposition and it would have been better i think to have the main character stumble through the same problems that they'd had with a loss of motivation why are we still doing this millennia after millennia oh my god there's a waste of our time (laughs) and then they actually stumble across slowly the evidence that they couldn't see for themselves but somebody else is bring, bringing together all this evidence. And then they get this real proper awakening where it is slammed in their face. What about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And it almost knocks them on their ass. You know, what is yeah. this thing that could knock down and humble an immortal being? An extra weapon? Nope, I've just defeated your new weapon. You know, oh, this amazing strategic plot that I've come up with. Sorry, I've been playing chess for 2,000 years. Mm-hmm. I win. And all of these <laughs> things they defeat... And then they come across this board of power that shows them the thing that they couldn't see, and she drops to her knees. And because that was done in exposition and not through this reveal, I think they missed their point all the way through the film to really make the most of this thing. But as I say, they tease it. There's this idea, there's this concept that she's struggling with, but it's always, okay, can you put that back in your pocket now because we need you to fight with that axe? Why on earth are you fighting with that crazy axe, by the way? Well, actually, that could have been a plot point. You know, I am 2,000 years old and I really struggle to learn new things. So I've got my axe because I know I can trust it. There's part of my instinct and that doesn't come in. So they miss these things that they could comment on that I think would have made it truly good and probably is in the source material, I guess. But then it is turned into an action film. So I think that they did have a good concept And I did enjoy the film, but I will acknowledge because I think they didn't commit to it completely and went into the action more, couldn't enjoy it. But I do want to say one more thing, though, about the two main characters that were a gay couple. I did actually enjoy their righteous scene 
and I'm someone that hates righteous scenes because I, I find them to be just so, oh, you know, I just want to throw up. It just, but the, the bit where they do face that bigotry and then he does give his essentially love poem back to that person and the love poem actually makes the bigot even more shrivel into themselves. I really enjoyed that. I didn't necessarily get as much out of the oh, darling, you always take your coffee that way and have done for a thousand years, by the way, we're gay. (laughs) That wasn't really much for me. (laughs) But that scene where he actually turns to the bigoted soldier and says, this is the actual description of the love that you're mocking, cower before it, and all the soldiers peel back. I I thought that was really well done, actually. Yeah, I think the relationship was fine as it was presented. I just think the, the way that they sort of introduced it was a bit clumsy and it's those things that they don't cover so it's the idea of we live in a world where relationships may not last all that long you know you hear about people and it's like they can't stay together for two years and you've got this couple that have been together for two thousand years and it's like what does a functional long-term relationship look like and i think they did that in the performance their performance was excellent but there's almost that contrast that you need it's like well look these two people have been together for like two thousand years it's like This person flits from relationship to relationship once every couple of months. They can't fathom being together with someone for that long. But again, that's something that, yeah, you have to pick a lane and go with it. And I'm really disappointed that they have to pick the lane that's, our villain is the evil lead of a pharmaceutical company. Like, (laughs) come on. This is like page two on your big book of cliches. Like, who's our villain? (laughs) Pharmaceutical right, so. company owner. There we go. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, if there was someone looking for the abilities of these people, it would be a massive pharmaceutical company. But the guy, is it Dudley from Harry Potter? <laughs> you go, <laughs> no. It's just, oh, it's awful. Could he have been like less obviously evil? I mean, he was kind of useless evil. That's yeah. the problem. <laughs> it's like he's the boss of a pharmaceutical company. Now, I could have taken moustache twirly devious, but he just seems like everyone else would have trodden over him in corporate world. You know what I mean? He doesn't seem like the guy that would get there. He seems like the guy who would be sniveling before the guy that got there. He just didn't reek of boss material to me. You sit there, you wonder, how did he get there? It's like, how did this happen? What did he discover that suddenly made him able to get in that position? Yeah. And then there's also the whole thing about, well, should we allow someone to study us? Because we could maybe solve a lot of problems since we're essentially immortal. But again, no time for that debate. Let's go in and just shoot everybody in the place, including the, just the security guards that just happened to show up for work that day. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Do they deserve that just because their boss is a dick? Probably not. But let's not get into the ethics of that because we don't have time because we've only got one film and might get another one at some point if the fans and Netflix demand it. Following the response it's got, I think it's likely to get something, be it a TVE type spin off or a follow up. I guess so. The assets are there. What I think will happen post this situation is when productions can start up again, I think we'll resume a lot of things where they've got a lot of the assets already in place, where they've got like potential contracts and stuff. So you'll see a lot of, not that you don't see a lot of sequels normally, mm-hmm. but you'll see a lot of sequels and TV series getting brought back that might not have otherwise and things like that because they can hit the ground running with it quickly. S- simple as that. I think it is an interesting time for that. It's like, do you renew the tried and tested thing that you've got or maybe the slightly shaky thing that you've got because all the assets and the contracts are there? Or do you try and start up something risky after all of this? I don't know. It's weird, isn't it? It's it's going to be interesting because there's shows that are probably verging on cancellation that either might get another season or are just going to get cancelled and not get the chance to come back because they've had their season chopped in half. Yeah, production stopped and they just go, right, we're calling that the season finale, right? We'll discuss if you're getting another season later. Quite a few shows that were in that position where they were filming maybe halfway through a season and they've had a, what would have been their mid-season break or maybe not even that. And that's like, yeah, yeah, we're going to end the season on this note here and then we'll discuss if it's coming back or not. I think this whole COVID situation was just to keep Supernatural in the air for a bit longer. I think that's why it was. (laughs) It's like, we said we were leaving at season 15, but we won't let you finish it. (laughs) There's a conspiracy theory for you. I like it. It it wasn't Disney to make sure everybody was watching Disney+. Plus. It was rabid Supernatural fans who just (laughs) released this virus so that 
the show would never end. I've seen 15 series worth of rituals. They must have picked something up by now on how to use the dark arts. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out something in the show was actually real by accident. Even though they did a whole episode on people making a film out of things that were actually real and it causing problems. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so let's move on to some news. Unless you had anything else, Chris or Aaron, because I've tapped out everything interesting that I've been watching. Uh don't think I've got anything new. No, I've got nothing new. Like Chris, everything else I've been watching is I've rewatched some things that I really liked. I'll give Final Space a mention just because that was top of my list. But yeah, it's all old stuff otherwise. Cool. Okay. So before we get to our selected news slash trailers slash whatever items we brought, we'll discuss this hot off the presses news as of yesterday at the time of recording. Disney have announced that they will be releasing Mulan on their streaming service, Disney Plus. But there's a catch. If you're a Disney Plus subscriber, you can pay an additional $30 to watch it for a rental. For a rental. On top of your £7 a month or whatever it is. I mean, we're in a consortium and pay annually, so we don't even have to think about it until next year and then decide whether we want to keep the service or not. Is that legal? I don't know if you want to mention that. Is that fine? I'm not sure. Do you need to cut that? Uh, No, I'm going to leave it in. It's fine. I don't think it's a problem. You get people on podcasts talking about using nefarious means to watch stuff. So, I mean, how have I watched Brave New World on the Peacock streaming service while I'm in the UK? Fair enough. (laughs) Regular flights to the United States, as we have discussed in previous (laughs) podcasts. (laughs) In the middle of a lockdown situation as well, I'm like flying to the US. It's really dangerous. Yes, I'm wearing a mask on these flights. So, so this is happening, and I suspect it's a litmus test for whether they can do more of it, because there's some other films that are lingering about that they might not get to, in fact, they definitely won't get to release this year. New Mutants, which is that kind of awkward hanger-on that they had from the Fox merger situation. Doesn't a exist. Film that, Doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Does not a, exist. It's, it's a, a film they legally... <laughs> <laughs> you guys spend a lot of time talking about something that doesn't actually exist. I mean, isn't that what this podcast essentially is? Well, let's not question our own reality yeah. here, because that leads to a bad place. But regardless of that, so there, there's these films that contractually they have to come out in theatres. New Mutants is one of them. So Mulan, which is the chosen film, is getting a theatrical release everywhere that Disney Plus isn't, which is great. <laughs> so If they have open theatres. Yes, uh, there's so many characters. I won't tease them that way. Yeah. You could have been watching this. Yeah. So I think this is an interesting notion because I'm not going to pay 30 quid or $30 or whatever the price point is in the UK to watch Mulan once. I'm just not no. going to do it. If I'm going to pay that much for a film, I want to own it and I want to watch yeah. it whenever I want. And I'd want the physical disc as well because they can't take that off me. Not without a fight anyway. <laughs> Chris, you heard it here. And Craig has just challenged the entirety of Disney to a fight. <laughs> That's it. I'll just fight them all. Fight them all for, to keep my copy of Mulan. <laughs> the original, because they want to make sure that no one remembers the original because their live action shiny remake is coming out. I've got to say, I've never watched the original Mulan in full. I think I've seen clips of it, but I've never, or uh, bits of it as I've seen it on telly or whatever, but I have never seen the whole thing. So what do we think of this idea? Let's release it for a premium price on a service you're already paying for. It's odd. I think it's a strange choice, and I don't think it'll pay off necessarily. I think you've covered it with the price thing. You might have paid the price of a cinema ticket to go and see something that you were expecting to go and see in the cinema because it's pandemic times. You know, people might behave slightly differently because it's a pandemic. I've got screaming kids that wanted to see it. Oh my God, well, what am I going to do? Yep, I'm prepared to pay the price of a cinema ticket for just one of us to get my family to be able to see it. But at the cost of owning it is the cost of rental. That is a weird one to, to explain. Unless they're trying to sell it, this is the cost of a family cinema ticket. But I have not seen any of that in the marketing to, to, to even suggest that. No, but that's in the subtext, isn't it? The idea that if you're a family of four, a night at the cinema probably costs, if you're buying your kids snacks at the cinema and stuff, you're probably looking at somewhere near 50 quid between tickets and snacks and whatever else. So people look at this and be like, well, this is only 30 bucks. That's cheaper than us going. 
So let's do that. I mean, that's the point that I'm coming down on is more that they're aiming this at families buying the film to screen for their kids and having a film night at home kind of thing. I don't think they're necessarily looking at a one-off individual paying £30, $30 to watch the film by itself because quite rightly I would look at that myself and go, well, that's a rip-off and I'm not paying that much to rent a film. Yeah. Whereas, like Aaron says, if I've got two kids that want to see it, me and my imaginary missus can sit <laughs> in front of our two imaginary kids and we can watch the film for £30. It's about the same price as you would pay if you were going down to Cineworld or View or Odeon to watch a film. And some people might take that option. I do think you're right in saying, well, is this a, when they say rental, if they mean you get to watch it once, you get to watch it for two days. I think if you rent on iTunes, I think as soon as you start watching something, you get two days. Amazon's the same. Yeah. I think it's about 48 hours for a rental. Once you hit play, the counter starts basically. Yeah, you could watch it as many times as you want within 48 hours. Yeah, I think it's a bit steep for that. It's an interesting move, given the films that Disney has on its roster to come out. It's a very interesting move. Also, weirdly, in things like, do you count this as sort of a direct-to-video? Because they're saying that they're releasing it in certain cinemas at the same time. I mean, it's essentially a direct-to-video release for the likes of award seasons and everything like that. Not that I think that Disney is particularly pining for awards all the time, but... Certainly not for something like this, no. No, but at the same time, these are the kind of films that do get the costume nominations or the graphic nominations or the original song nominations for Disney, where they might not be winning for drama and direction and acting. Normally they get nominated for all the amazing work that some of these people in the background do. Yeah, And this kind of knocks them out for that, especially considering the amount of fighting that there's been over what is allowed to get classed as a film for nomination. Because it's basically saying now, if you do a limited release window and then put it on a streaming platform, it doesn't count. To knock Netflix out of the count is what that was done for originally. (laughs) And inadvertently, they've now sort of kicked themselves out for several of these films. So it's an interesting move. I don't think it will make as much money as it would do if it went to cinemas. Oh, definitely not. I don't think it will make them as much money, but potentially it will make them more than if they just threw it up on the platform, especially considering the number of subscribers they've already got. Yeah, You're not going to entice more subscribers when you've already got the millions of subs that they've already got. People might cash in their trial and then pay for Mulan, watch with the kids for a weekend, that kind of thing. Exactly. You know, oh, I've got a spare email account. Okay, well, we'll sign up for that. And that's just got another month for Disney and we can watch Mulan now. There we go, job done. And then at the end of that month, the trial ends and they don't stick about. Because a lot of these platforms, especially new ones like Disney, have got the problem of what content are you going to have on your platform? Disney's lucky that it's got some things in the can We've got the likes of Mandalorian coming out in October. Uh, yay. Uh, but, <laughs> but when you look, a lot of the Marvel stuff that they were hedging their bets on has all been bumped back. Yeah. So they're, they're going to be scratching around a lot of these platforms. I mean, things that we're talking about just now, like Umbrella Academy or Snowpiercer, were things that were already filmed and already scheduled for release. So dates and all that are, are going to get movable. I don't think we've quite hit the drought that people think we're going to hit yet when it comes no. to TV content. I think we're only witnessing the beginning of it. We're not in the middle of, oh, there's nothing to watch yet. It's going to happen. Yeah, but the real reason for this attempt, what they're doing, is it happened on the same day that Disney reported a $3.5 billion loss and that's because their theme parks are closed. So that gives you an idea of where they expect most of the revenue to come from, the theme parks. That's what generates the most revenue. Films, not so much. Well, I mean, films generate a lot of money for them, of course, and other interests that they have generate lots of money. But it's the theme parks, so that's the stuff that ticks over. That's where their fortune is made, effectively. So for this, I guess they're, right, okay, let's try and make some money out of this thing we've got. We're not going to wait, and we're going to see how this goes. And then some people are saying it's a bit of a litmus test for this, shortening the release window, perhaps, or maybe doing simultaneous releases more often with different films. And then naturally you get all the people saying, but this will kill the cinema. People won't go anymore. And I don't think that's true. I think 
people that want to see a Marvel film or a Star Wars film or whatever, one of your big budget, see this on the biggest screen that you can sort of films, we'll always get people in the seats. It's the mid-range sort of indie stuff that might not benefit from that because if you can watch your low-budget indie thing in the cinema for 11 quid or you can watch it at home for less, then you're going to probably do that because it's not about the visuals necessarily. I mean, the cinematography might be beautiful and stuff, but broadly speaking, I don't think your general public, whoever these general public are, you know, draw a general public person, (laughs) will really care about that sort of stuff for smaller films. But it's like, oh yeah, Mission Impossible. I want to see Tom Cruise go into space. Of course I do. I'm going to watch that on the biggest screen I can find. There's an IMAX near me. I'll go see that. You get a lot of people that will do that. But I don't think this is necessarily going to change the game in that respect. I think if we're to cure this virus tomorrow, suddenly cinema release stuff would go back to the way it was. You'd get the three-month gap before it appears on home video or whatever, and then that'd be it. That's my take. I am not a box office analyst expert person. (laughs) The internet seems to be full of all these expert virologists, expert economists, expert box office analysts. It's like, wow, you're really wasted in your call centre, restaurant or fast food job when you can do all this. (laughs) And in the character count that Twitter gives you. Amazing. Now you are completely not being used to your full potential. So I don't know how it's going to shake out. I guess we'll see what happens when the film comes out. How many people buy it. Yeah, I think for the people that do like watching the box office stats and the numbers that come back from these films, it is an interesting time to look at these things. But I think you've got to judge stuff under pandemic at the moment rather than, oh, this is the changing user habits for the future. I think cinemas already had a bit of a problem when it came to streaming services releasing films and Disney coming up with Disney Plus. And yes, they are likely to start pulling the windows a bit closer, especially on their own exclusive platforms to try and encourage people to get in. But I think cinema's comeback has got to be on the experience. (laughs) You know, you've got to make sure you've got the best sound, the biggest screens, the comfiest seats, make it an experience that is worth paying £10 to go and see rather than relying on people wanting to see the film before it goes out on video make sure it is the best experience it possibly can be for people that are paying their hard-earned cash i think you're right the films that will struggle will be the ones that are a risk to buy a ticket the unknown quantities from unknown directors or unknown stories that's where people will be more choosy about what they are going to see at the cinema because it's not a guaranteed blockbuster. It's not a guaranteed enjoyable film. We've all sat through our fair share of absolute dreadful stuff that has been put in front of you. (laughs) And that comes from all budgets, to be fair. It comes from all budgets, to be fair. Even the ones that you look at trailers or you look at things and go, well, this is guaranteed fun. You come out and you go, oh my God, what have I just witnessed? (laughs) However... Your people that go to the cinema maybe once a month, maybe once every two months, are far more choosy about what they will go and see than someone like you or me that's maybe got a a cinema pass and can go in and out and pick films at less of a risk, less of a cost. Yeah. Agreed. So it's interesting. We'll maybe talk about it more once the film's actually out and stuff. And I would have seen Mulan in the cinema. I mean, the fact is we're not being slaves to the original that's an appealing thing for me because hmm. I've sat through all the bloody Disney live action remakes and thought, why did you make this? And then Lion King reports 1.247 billion in its theatrical run. It's like, oh, that's why you know. <laughs> that's why you put so little effort in in terms of actually retelling the story. Okay, cool. <laughs> I see why you're doing it. I mean, it's obvious why they're doing it anyway. Films come out to make money from major studios. That's why they come out. <laughs> they don't come out because, oh, yes, we think this is important to have in the world artistically. It's like, no, we want it to make money. We want our investor to get their money back. And then some. That's what we want. We want to report these profits. But, yeah. And then, I mean, what's going to happen with Tenet or Tenet or however the hell you're supposed to pronounce it? <laughs> it's just getting stupid now. It really is. It's like, we're going to bring it out everywhere except America for a while and then see what happens there. And then, oh yeah, in Scotland, we're still not probably opening all cinemas by then, so you might not get to see it if you want to see it. And it's probably not safe to go anyway because, like, look at this, it's mental. It's insane. We're in real danger here. And it's the best way to avoid that danger, sitting in a cinema. Probably not. 
So might just have to miss the Christopher Nolan film, people. Shall we move on in terms of our news coverage? Yes. Cool. Okay, Aaron, do you want to kick us off with your chosen items? Chosen items for me, uncharacteristically, are two horrors, although one of them is only a comedy horror, so maybe that's okay. But the top of the lift I'll give to Lovecraft Country, I think, which is very interesting. Another thing that I'll say I've not seen the source material from. I'm obviously not a source material person. I don't know if I'm missing (laughs) out because of this. But it's kind of an obvious pick almost because it is connecting to the problems of black America that are still existing. And you've only got to look at the news every day to see. In fact, even though here in Britain, to be honest, it's still carrying on. So it has an automatic relevance tick when asking, am I going to get anything meaningful out of this? But I've also got the game's connection to Lovecraft itself. And I know it's not actually Lovecraft. It's just in the vein thereof. But once something becomes that old and gathers that much of a fan base, you know, you still show your link back to your original. What's really interesting about combining those two things though is the i think i'm not going too far out of place here by saying that i don't think lovecraft was a perfectly accepting of other races individual i think he might have had some issues along those sorts of things that people back in that time did and then here we come along with somebody has taken that material that might have been produced by somebody with that old-fashioned bigotry and said, no, let's actually use your stuff, but let's face off this concern that maybe you ignored. So it's almost an interesting claiming and updating in a political way of some old material, which I thought was almost worth mention, because they didn't just reject it because of old problems. They've actually embraced it and said, no, we can do something with it here to actually even highlight the issue and this is our film, or...? So it's a TV series, TV. HBO. I suppose I've assumed everybody knows what it is, but I guess they haven't. <laughs> so it's about a young black American who's travelling across America, what does it say here, in the 1950s. So he's obviously suffering from the segregation, the legal segregation as it was, which obviously makes it worse. And the character deals with the problems of his simple birth by having to cross America. But he also has the problems that come with his birth that he is supposed to have some sort of long lost birthright in his family, which I'm not sure if it is specified in the trailers, but it looks like he might have a lost wealth that should have been claimed by his family, whether that's property or whether that's a mystical, magical, evil amulet that summons the horrors of old gods that we're, you know, we're not really sure, but (laughs) that's where he's going to end up. He's going to end up suffering the evils of the old gods. So it's got the horror element and it has the Lovecraftian connection in this TV series, but it also has the racial element and the politics What I haven't been able to do, and it might not be possible, is combine the two. Because you'd sort of be expecting when you say that both of them are their birthright, or one of them being positive and one of them being negative, but actually the positive one is also going to turn out to be really bad. Are they supposed to be representative? But the idea that somebody's trying to represent the evils of white privilege by Cthulhu, greatest of the old gods, I... (laughs) I'm not seeing it. Is a metaphor of white privilege a dark and evil tentacle? It just doesn't sound like it's got legs. Ha ha ha. Or, um, or but, tentacles. Exactly. <laughs> Either way, it's definitely something that looks like it could have something to say rather than just being a horror. And I don't like horror, so I wouldn't watch it if it's just going to be a horror show. And it also looks like it's going to need something political to say as well because. As somebody who doesn't like horror, I found the trailer not very horror, which I think is a potential issue. 
okay. that it, it might face, which is a bit of a shame. They had a choice to make when they do Lovecraft as well, in that are you going to go down the route of some of the stories where the monsters are described, but they're always described in such a way that you can't quite picture it. You know what I mean? It, it it describes something that cannot be described. And obviously Lovecraft put a lot of effort into that because even though he's describing it, you have to create the horror yourself. And that's quite important. And then the natural extension of that is the other ones that don't describe it. What is the color out of space? The whole point is it's a color that you've never seen before and it blows your mind to see it. You therefore cannot put that on camera. <laughs> it's not possible to film that. So you can only provide the horror of that by seeing the things around it and by not showing the monster. Yeah. Now, they have already shown in the trailer three monsters. One undead, yeah, whatever. One tentacle out of the ground, yeah, it's a bit average. And then they show you an actual cthulhu creature. And my knowledge of the lore isn't good enough to tell you which creature it is. And somebody can reply to the podcast and tell us. But it isn't relevant because when you're looking and you go... Yeah, that looks nasty. I wouldn't want to stand next to that. That would probably rip me to pieces. <laughs> but I'm not horrified because I've seen the monster, you know. So I think that's a big shame. I think the idea that it shows you this political creeping horror being possible, this whole idea of how can you possibly in 1950s America defeat white privilege it's there it's all around you it hates you it's coming for you and you don't stand a chance against it that's cthulhu so it feels like in order to really mix these two things together it should have been in the foreground the white privilege the bigotry the horrific torture being done to, to black americans and then in the background you never see it the lovecraftian horror that's potentially feeding on this and making everybody's natural inclinations even worse to the extent that the heroes are then trapped in this already difficult situation, then suddenly supernaturally horrific. So I felt like I was offered something and then immediately had it taken away in the trailer. And I'm not quite sure what the angle is going to be now. So I feel like I can watch it because it's not actually going to be that scary horror. But I'm also slightly disappointed because... <laughs> If you're going to give me Lovecraft, you really should be trying to make me feel terror, shouldn't you, maybe? That sounds like a pitch for the reviews that I'm going to ask you to write when they come. No, well, maybe. <laughs> Congratulations, you're hired. Congratulations, yeah. you've just volunteered. It's like, what? It's like, I'll edit out the denial and then no one will ever know. Uh. <laughs> cool. So I haven't seen anything about this. I'll have a look at the trailer. You've piqued my interest with your description of a trailer, which presumably is about two minutes long, and you've picked up all this stuff. So, yeah, cool. Sounds interesting. I'm always interested in seeing Lovecraftian adaptations as well. Guillermo del Toro always wanted to do a version of At the Mountains of Madness, but could never agree with the studio as to what version of it mm. would he be allowed to make. It's like, mm, put a love story in it. It's like, it's a story of Cthulhu. We don't need yeah. a love story. <laughs> that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. Cool. That will certainly be one to look for. The trailer will be in the show notes. And what was your second thing? So taking this back to the much less serious comic horror of Truth Seekers, which is the latest offering from Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. And I've almost said enough just with that, actually, <laughs> to describe it. It's Amazon Prime coming in the autumn and... The two of them are, as they always are, a comedy of sort of mildly charming idiots who will come good and save the day. And I can just say that to you and you could go, I've seen it. And I could say, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe you have. But <laughs> what are they doing? Where have they put it to? Well, they've kept their horror theme as they love, obviously. But this time it's supernatural. This time it's ghosts and spirits. And nonetheless... Even though there aren't too many zombies, maybe there probably will be. Oh, is the universe in dire threat and maybe wiped out by this? Yeah, probably. And will they save the day? Yes, they probably will. So it's what I said it was at the very start. It's the next offering from Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. But where they're good, they're really funny. And 
that is still possible, even though I've not laughed out loud at everything they've done, and, and I won't claim I have, I do find them funny enough to want to give them another shot with this. And I guess I didn't laugh out loud loads at the trailer, but that shows how much I sort of trust them that I'm still going to want to see this and try it to see if it is them in their full glory. Cool. I've not seen the trailer for this either, but Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, look at that look. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you say about how they save the day because they usually don't actually. Shaun of the Dead, the zombie apocalypse still persists at the end. With the world's end, the world ends. It's post-apocalyptic at the end. I mean, they're still alive, I suppose, which means that they survive. Well, they, they usually beat back the evil, and they usually come good in terms of they overcome whatever problem it was that was making them useless, <laughs> and they suddenly become less useless at the final moment in order to defeat the evil. Maybe they don't save the world, but they save the flat from the hordes of zombies that were going to kill them. They don't die. So yeah. they what's the world's end? They defeat the aliens, don't they? They do, but it also sets off their like, EMP that cuts off all power in the world. So Yeah, as I say, they're charming idiots. You know, they're, <laughs> they're always a bit useless. They overcome their general emotional uselessness, even though if there's a bit of collateral damage. I think that hails back to their inspiration. They were always inspired by the whole 70s zombie films Mm -hmm. where the good guys always lose that's kind of the point so they don't want to go 70s horror in that sense but they always want to connect back to it that adds to the final joke i think cool so one to look for chris what's your two things so i'm going to jump in with another trailer because why not so we've had the final trailer for the boys season two now i can't remember if you said that you had watched season one or not i have Yes, you have. There you go. Okay, so the the trailer for season two has dropped and it's pretty much promising more of the same. I've got to say, though, with the trailer, I'm a bit disappointed because they just seem to have thrown everything at it. Everything. Every scene, fight, gag thing, they've just thrown it all in. Now, it's either that this season is absolutely packed full and is going to be tons and tons of fun to watch or they have just thrown everything they possibly could, scattered scenes from around the whole thing and just thrown it into a trailer. It's one of the more messy trailers that I've seen in a while. And I don't know if it's just intentional to make it seem a bit haphazard because I know the show had that kind of edgy way that they did things or if it's just that the kind of gathered bits from around went, "Eh, that'll do, put music into it and and, uh, an explosion and stuff. There we go, done. It's not my favourite of trailers, I've got to Mm. say. I am looking forward to seeing the show because it did throw in surprises. It was an interesting twist on a a genre that we've seen again and again and again and again and again and sort of showing a different side to the whole superhero thing than, than you get in your standard Marvel film or your standard DC film. So it's an interesting take in it. It's got some fun characters in it, but this trailer didn't particularly make me go, oh, I must see this. I don't know if you've had the chance to watch it or not. So I haven't watched the final trailer. I did watch the first trailer, which was just a smash cut of shocking imagery. That's all it was. And I was like, yeah, okay. I wouldn't want to watch the show based on this trailer because it's not a very good trailer. That's the first trailer. I don't know Mm. the final one. You've said it sounds like about the same. That is more extended scenes (laughs) of the same. Still in the clippy short format. It drops a little bit more of the plot. We know there is another super joining the seven Stormfront or whatever her name is. Yes, yeah. so they've got a new foe, I suppose, that is joining in, who's going to rock things up a little bit. But yeah, it doesn't particularly compel me, unfortunately. Okay, but you'll still watch it. I will likely still watch it. You know what I'm like. I'm a sucker <laughs> for this kind of thing, and I will be. This looks crap, and then, and then day one. This I looks would... terrible. I must watch it all immediately. <laughs> I'm more encouraged by the release strategy for this season because they're only dumping the first three episodes on the opening day and then I'm not sure what they're doing after that whether it's week by week or they're just going to give us the rest of the season the following week But It's one of those things because like we've said, they're going to come up with this drought of content at some point so it makes sense to release it episodically and I, like Aaron, have went through a load of episodes of the Umbrella Academy very, 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 very quickly and now I'm like, okay, so what am I going to watch now? And it's like, oh, well, I'll just <laughs> burn through what would have been usually umpteen weeks worth of content. And I've just went, done, 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 done. Okay. 
If only there was a century of content to look back on. Yeah, if only. If only there were box sets from around the world, a collection, uh, if you wish, that you could pick up at any point and start watching stuff again. But yeah, I do like the episodic release. I think some stuff does play very well. And yes, you get that initial binge. But I think it's wiser to spread content out because people debate it for longer. It sticks around in people's memory. It allows people to chat about a show. It stops people being, oh, have you watched that yet? Oh, yeah, I've got two episodes in. All right, well, I won't spoil what happens 13 (laughs) episodes time for you then. Because I've just spent the whole weekend watching. End of conversation. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) that's it. I've spent the whole weekend. I've seen it all. So now I can't talk to you. Come back to me in two months when you've finished it. And I have moved on to something completely different and I've forgotten what happened in the show. Yeah, it's interesting. Do three episodes to get people hooked and then release it episodically maybe? Or do they release another three? I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure what they're planning to do. I don't know if they've announced it or I've missed it or whether, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, imagine what the cliffhanger in episode three (laughs) is. Why not do two episodes and then, why episode three? What's about to happen in episode three that's going to make us go, (gasps) It is a good question. We must instantly go to Twitter and discuss this with everyone. <laughs> For it is episode three, and we must now move on. <laughs> yeah. It's certainly more consumable in that kind of format. You're only spending three hours instead of like 10 hours to stay ahead of the curve, I suppose, if you're one who does like to do that. But we'll see. I like season one. I will watch season two, and I'll try and be kind of current with it. The Boys was one of those ones where I was reasonably current. I watched it like two weeks after it came on or whatever it was, which for me is really good. Most of the time, it's, have you seen Stranger Things? Like, nah. Have you seen this? Nah. Have you seen <laughs> this thing that released on Netflix? Like, nah, I'm still writing my review of The Flash from last week, so I don't have time, that kind of stuff. So there is the obligatory Flash reference. Had to happen. I wasn't kicking it this time. I was just saying that I was working on it, but which I'm not because I finished with it. But anyway, what's your second thing? My second thing is a TV show called Biohackers, which has had another trailer released. It's coming out, I think, 20th of August on Netflix. It's in German, and I think it's going to be subtitled, which normally would put me off and probably will still put me off a little bit because I'm not a big fan of watching stuff with subtitles. But the trailer's really, really interesting. It's called Biohackers. It is basically looking at the world of biohacking and genetic manipulation. It follows uh, Mia who studies medicine at a German university. She's there to study under this sort of renowned professor. However, there's a bit of mystery around her and about the research. And you can imagine the weird, wacky stuff that's going on under this biohacking. So the trailer sort of has people playing piano using plants and (laughs) glow-in-the-dark mice. This is the kind of weird stuff that they're doing under the guise of biohacking. But it seems to have sort of sinister manipulative undertones and it just seems really interesting you know when we said that we were going to be doing this podcast i was sort of looking at different trailers and this was one of the ones that sort of popped up and i went oh i always say oh i should try more stuff with subtitles on and maybe this will be the one that gets me into doing that so you're gonna give that a go i'm gonna give it a go you're gonna biohack your way to watching stuff with subtitles i'm gonna undergo gene therapy so that i can watch a program with subtitles yeah, or you could just learn German. That might be a bit easier. That sounds crazy. I know. <laughs> crazy talk. It'll never work. Yeah. <laughs> It'll never work. I can't speak English. Yeah, the next time I'll be on right. the podcast, I'll only be able to speak German. There's only <laughs> one language going in this brain, and I can't keep two languages together at the same time. No, no, no. That'd be hilarious. It's like, great. Now I have to transcribe Chrissy's bit. <laughs> Get a translator in. Cool. That sounds interesting. I'll have a look at the trailer, I guess. First, I've heard of it, so... Interesting. My two things. So I was in two minds about, or I was in a few minds about what to include because there's just so many things. I was going to go with the Lucifer trailer, which now I've mentioned it, so I could put it in the show notes, but I'm not going to talk in detail about it. It looks good. That's all I'm going to say. Looking forward to more Lucifer. But they have announced the release date of Star Trek Discovery. So the first episode comes on on Thursday, October 15th. And it was just a random announcement, which was great. So been struggling to get it done because obviously they've not been able to meet up for the post-production stuff so things like doing scoring and all that kind of stuff has been done remotely which obviously takes a while but now they've got it done and they're ready to release it lower decks is on as like tomorrow out of the day of recording so basically what we're going to get is we're getting 26 weeks of uninterrupted star trek 
So it's 10 episodes of, no, 23 weeks of uninterrupted Star Trek. Sorry. So it's 10 weeks of Lower Decks, which looks good, by the way. And I'm co-hosting a podcast on another network that I'll put in the show notes for that. <laughs> so got to plug the other thing that I'm doing. Lower Decks is an anime. Traitor. <laughs> I'm not a traitor. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> It's just appealing to be on something where I don't have to edit it sometimes. That's quite nice. <laughs> as if we'd make your editing a challenge. As if. Editing yeah. a challenge. Editing <laughs> a challenge. Editing a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lord X looks funny. I think it looks pretty good. There's always good people that hate it. More Discovery. This is them in the 30th or 31st century. I forget what it is, which is really cool. I'm looking forward to seeing the possibilities that they can get with that. There's no trailer yet. Well, there is. There's one trailer. It's a very short one. But And I think there was some new footage with the announcement. It was like a TV spot type thing. I imagine we'll get a full trailer within the next four or five weeks. Probably around the halfway point of Lower Decks. We'll be like, oh, great. You might see some discovery. Here it is. Seems a perfect time to drop a trailer as once Lower Decks has started airing, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, while everyone's talking about to put it in. I'm glad that it's got a release date and that it's moving forward. Lower Decks being tomorrow and not having any international release partner just seems very weird. Unless it's yeah. going to just suddenly spring up on some platform. You'll just be on Netflix looking for the trailer for... <laughs> biohackers well there it is <laughs> it's arrived with yeah. like no fanfare no marketing whatsoever it's just like Ta-da, here it is uh, they kind of dropped the ball on that one although there's people that perhaps want it to fail or want to not like it because fans are like that sometimes have said oh netflix and amazon passed on it because it's crap it's like, well okay where's your source oh we got this covered okay <laughs> Great. I mean, it's different. That's the thing. It's a different sort of format for the Trek world. And, and if Star Trek teaches us anything, everything different must go. No room for any of that. <laughs> That's the overall message of Star Trek. <laughs> it looks interesting, and the trailer seems quite funny and interesting that sort of way for Lower Decks. For Discovery, I did enjoy the last season with some caveats and bits and pieces, but I enjoyed some of what they did last season. So seeing the new one, Yes, looking mm. forward to it. The fact that they've announced more Trek content coming out. I always keep getting the name wrong. Is it Brand New Worlds they're calling it? I'm trying to remember what they're Strange calling. New Worlds. Strange New Worlds. There we go. Knew you'd know. <laughs> Strange New Worlds they've announced. Really up for that. Definitely up for that. Yeah. They should have just called it hashtag we built the sets. <laughs> or they built the sets. <laughs> we built the sets. So we're yeah. doing it. It makes a lot of sense to do that. And after seeing a lot of the cast at... Birmingham for that. They just seem like their heart's in the right place for it, and they're mm-hmm. really, really keen to do it. And you can guess that they've probably had some words of, oh, we might do this, and this might be the plan for it. And if they're excited for it, then I'm excited for it. Yeah. That's a decent, succinct summary of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. My second thing is that Michael Keaton might be coming back as Batman. I almost feel like there should be a feature on the podcast where it's will not happen or today on will not happen <laughs> because I'm fairly sure this isn't going to happen. Although there's been so much talk of it that now it almost has to happen. It's like before they announced Civil War was getting made into a film. It got to the point where it's like, well, there's been so many leaks and stuff. Now we have to make this. There's no way out of this. People will lynch us in the streets if we don't. So it's almost getting to that point with Michael Keaton. But the idea of him coming back as Batman's an interesting one. I think maybe he's better suited to being that character now than he was back then, even. I think it'd be really cool to see him revisit that role. I mean, it's Batman or Birdman. What is he? Is he just going to be falling back into these types of roles? But there's all this chat about he's going to be this almost custodian of their shared universe. It isn't really a shared universe, so it might be like multiverse hopping. So he'll just turn up in other people's films as well. Which is what they've said about Superman. So what are you going to have in alternate films is like Henry Cavill turn up and say, hi, I want you to join my team. And then Michael Keaton will turn up in another film and be like, I want you to join this other team that I'm making. <laughs> it's called the Justice League. It's like, I was asked to join this other Justice League. It's like, no, no, mine's is better. My Justice League's better. It's, it seems a bit confusing. Surely he is going to fulfill the open DC slot that is filled in the Marvel setup by Samuel L. Jackson. He's the really old actor that somehow seems to be able to keep going, be in everything, links everything together by literally turning up and being cool. That's the role he's going to play. Because <laughs> he can't be Batman. I mean, he's almost 70. But surely he's Bruce Wayne rather than Batman. That I could buy. 
an old Bruce Wayne who's already passed on the cowl, as it were, has a more administrative role in the background, even if it is across the multiverse admin, which is, <laughs> yeah, you know, you've got to be quite clever for that. So you need your back computer for it. But that feels like the more believable slot than have him turn up in the costume right get the stunt man in because he needs to do something and he says i'm 70 mate what do you want from me you know well he did all right in spider-man to be fair when he was wearing his vulture costume that wasn't that how old was he then i've forgotten how far back in time that was now it was only like i don't know it was the same year that infinity war came out what year was that or was it the year before know. Infinity War? I'm that old myself, I can't remember. Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. We all measure time in Marvel films anyway. It was like <laughs> <laughs> five Marvel films ago, which is, sure. I don't know, a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they've said that, but they've also... Well, I don't think anything's official about Henry Cavill returning as Superman either. There's nothing official about this, but it's been suggested that Henry Cavill might also fulfil a similar role. So you're going to have two people doing that? It seems in a world where they've got a sort of shared universe or a joint line of characters, right? What is canon? What is not canon? What's a sort of a what-if story rather than a this is part of the canon and you must understand all of these things to be connected? DC seems to be throwing a lot out there at the moment of, well, this character will connect these stories. And basically, if he turns up, it's part of this universe. If Superman turns up, it's part of that universe. There we go. <laughs> and the other Batman, when he turns up, it's part of the Batman-verse. It's over there. <laughs> and then that's it. There you go. Sorted. I don't know. It- and then Michael Keaton turns up in the Robert Pattinson sequel and everything's thrown out the window. No one knows what's going on. Ah, you didn't see this coming. They're all now part of the same yeah. thing. And now it's all it's all there. And Wonder Woman, yes, she has her own universe as well now. And yeah, uh, yeah there we go. We have a multiverse Justice League for some reason, because apparently we can't have them all being in the yeah. same place. Yeah. And also The Flash, which is happening, but isn't happening, but maybe is happening until observed otherwise. So, yeah, I don't know. It depends who Ezra Miller decides to strangle while being on film. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, it does seem odd, I don't have a problem with Michael Keaton turning up in these films. I'm like, why not? Sure. And the fact that they seem to be going down the line of a lot of what-if films, similar to when they did Joker, but then seemed to sort of renege on the promise of, oh, it's a what-if and a one-off and a not-a-universe-spanning thing. It's a just what-if. And they've now gone, oh, actually, it's going to be a thing. And it's like, okay, all right, so you've went back on that. And I've not heard quite, what their plans are for the Batman. Yeah. If it is supposed to be, okay, we're going back to an origin, or, oh, we're going back to tying everything together again. Not to mention the fact that you've also got Shazam out there as well, that I've not quite mentioned, and that was through its final scene sort of thing, trying to tie in with Superman and everything else going on. Well, so, yeah, it's more that these characters yeah. exist in that universe and they look like they did in the other films like the the bat yeah. symbols the same the superman look is the same i don't know it's a weird one i mean there was all these talk about or there was always speculation that wouldn't it be great if michael keaton came back as bruce wayne in a batman beyond film and for people that don't know what batman beyond is it's a sequel to the 90s batman animated series cartoon which is set in the future and bruce wayne is a mentor to a kid called terry mcginnis who wears a high-tech version of the bat suit that can fly and so on. And it's really good. It's Kevin Conroy still voicing Bruce Wayne in that. And he's older, he's grizzled, he's a bit less hopeful than he was. And Terry McGuinness teaches him hope again. And You know the (laughs) mentor-mentee relationship. It's played out ad nauseum in different things. So it's the same kind of thing, but it's done pretty well. And... Maybe this will be that, to be fair. Maybe they could just do Batman Beyond at the same time. Who yeah, knows? I mean, it makes sense to have him in that kind of role of like either a future Batman or a future Bruce Wayne more than a future Batman. A future Bruce Wayne going back and trying to correct a mistake that was made or trying to... He goes back and tries to wipe out Batman and Robin from existence. It's like, <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> there was no back credit card. It's fine. But it's supposed to be the Flashpoint movie that Michael Keaton's in, so... Yeah, yeah. it's all alternates and things and reboots and... Yeah, I don't know. We're never going to know until we see these things. I've got to say, it's going to be full of speculation until observed otherwise. Yeah. And I think they're still trying to play that. No, we're just going to do individual films for now and then we might bring everything back, which is what they should have done 
in the first place. We're going to make the best films that we can, and if we can pull these characters together in the future in something that makes sense, then we will, rather than what they started with. We've come full circle on the whole DC debate now, though. At first it was, what the hell are they trying to do? And then when it was their standalone, we're concentrating on making good films, it's the, all right, cool, we're, we know what they're trying to do here. They're just trying to make individual films, not worrying mm. about connecting them. And now we're back to, what the hell are they trying to do? <laughs> <laughs> How are they going to connect all these again? <laughs> We've got Michael Keaton as an overseer of the universe. We've got potentially Superman as an overseer of the universe. <laughs> are they conflicting? Does one person have a different idea about how the universe should look? <laughs> Will they fight together in some sort of Batman v Superman thing, but across the multiverse? Henry Cavill versus Michael Keaton. I want to see that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, we're saying we want to see it. We want to see it as a very, very, very short film. But we do want to see it. Thank you. Maybe they just race in building a PC. Maybe that's what they do. (laughs) Yes. Why not? We know Henry Cavill likes to do that and put his motherboard in backwards and then have to fix it. That was quite funny. That weirdly went viral. It's like, let's watch Henry Cavill building a PC. And I did. Yeah, I look exactly the same when I'm building a PC. I look just as good as I'm doing it. Um, yep. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so Michael Keaton might come back. I'm kind of excited about it. I do would like to see that. I really would because I don't know if he was necessarily a good Batman, but he was a good version of Batman for that film that he was in, so or those two films he was in. So. Hmm. It'd be interesting to see him tackle it when he's a bit older. Sometimes that's better. You see an actor who plays a character when they're young and then they return to them like decades later and they're so much better suited to it decades later somehow, despite the fact that they were supposed to like blaze the trail with them. So we'll find out when they announce it or not announce it. It's not official at this point. It's weird. It's just all this kind of massive rumour that's now (laughs) self-sustaining. By the time you listen to this podcast, it may no longer be rumour. It might still be rumour. It might definitely not be happening. Could you imagine if DC say, no, we're not going to do this. We reached out to Michael Keaton and he told us to piss off. You will hear the disappointment on the internet. Bad news, everyone. (laughs) Michael Keaton said no. Good news. George Clooney said yes. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Bet you didn't see that coming. And then on the first day of filming, George Clooney broke his leg. But don't worry, we've got Val Kilmer to step in. (laughs) I mean, we're all waiting for the Arnold Schwarzenegger Mr. Freeze verse. I'm just saying. <laughs> so it's... I have no problem with Arnie's Mr. Freeze. He is the only one who knows what film he's in, in that film. <laughs> he's the true. only one who understands what he's doing. So he is just loving it. Every line he delivers is with just complete glee. He just can't get enough of what he's doing. Is that the same one with uh, Green Bane as well? Yes. No. Yes. yes. You can only say when his name. Says, yeah. <laughs> Bane, Bane, Bane is a fantastic villain. Oh, let me show you the real Bane. Uh, (laughs) Let's go a few films back here, everyone. Yeah. (laughs) Let's see the original theatrical The original and the best. Yeah. So that's us. We both had both, all three of us had two news items. Oh, talked about. (laughs) (laughs) Aaron's in Lovecraft country now. He can't be reached. Yeah. So that is it. We'll maybe come back and do another news roundup or what we've been watching roundup if there is cause to do it otherwise we have an agents of shield podcast coming up if there's time i might like to do a boys season one one but i don't know if there'll be time i do plan to rewatch it before season two comes we've got about a month at the time of recording so we'll maybe see how it goes and we should probably do our star trek discovery season two one we are only like a year and a half late i'm convinced that we did a star trek (laughs) discovery season two one and (laughs) And I'm surprised otherwise. Yeah, I know. I just I know I, I think I would need to now rewatch and remind myself, but I'm convinced I have recorded this podcast. Or at least we just have held had... up in production because of the pandemic. <laughs> That's I, it. I, yeah. It's held held up in production and being recorded in isolation, as always. It's either that or we have had a podcast worth of discussion over a beer at some point that was just never recorded. I think that's most likely what it was. I feel I've had this debate about the show, and I've just, like, okay, we just didn't record that happening. Okay. Well, my plan is to rewatch season two before it comes on anyway, so there's plenty of time. Yeah, just rewatch it as uh, previously on Star Trek Discovery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, listeners, there is stuff coming, so... Be assured of that. 
So, Aaron, I will thank you for being here and contributing your content that you've been watching and anticipating watching. Do I still need to pretend to be in Lovecraft Country? That's as good a goodbye as any, I guess. Chris, Bye. thank you for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be here. My pleasure. So that was our lockdown news and content discussion. Thanks to Neil Stenson for his cover of the Batman theme playing me out right now. If you like what you heard, then please do subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or any major podcasting app. iTunes users, it'd be great if you leave us a star rating and a comment. If you want to discuss anything we brought up here, or pretty much anything else, you can find us on Facebook or Twitter under New Before Blog, or leave a comment on newbeforeblog.co.uk. As always, we hope you'll join us on the next Neil Before Pod. <laughs>